Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord, for bringing us here today. We thank you for this beautiful day, and we thank you for this place where we can come and worship. Be with us, guide us throughout uh, this sermon, open our hearts, open our minds, and, uh, and Lord, just help us grow closer to you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Have you ever felt that you had been called to do something that you did not feel prepared to do it? Feel inadequate in what he's been asking of you. I remember when we moved from, the, from Toronto to Kelowna. I joined the, we joined the West Bank Church in Kelowna. And uh, I was, uh, our ministry was divided between two churches, West Bank and Sun Valley. Sun Valley, I came right away as the pastor. Um, but at West Bank, there was uh, an older gentleman, an older pastor. And probably many of you will know him, uh, Pastor Bob Tates. And uh, so I met him there. And uh, he, at the time, he was leading the West Bank Church. So the conference placed me as uh, his assistant which was great. Uh, and so I get to know him, and I got to know him, and uh, we developed a friendship. And uh, things were going very well. And six months after, he calls me one day, hey, Roger, I'm stepping down. You're the head. You're the main pastor now of the church. I have things to do in my life. I'm retired. I shouldn't be doing this. And, and if you know Pastor Bob, you know that he's very um, vocal, and he can he can come up with all these reasons to do things. And, uh, and so he was, we, we had a long conversation, but he was determined. He wanted to fully retire. And so uh, for that to happen, we would have to reverse roles. And I told him, okay, we'll, we'll do that. But I remember at the end of that conversation, I was feeling so inadequate. He had been there for several years now. He was a loved pastor for that church. And I knew that replacing him would just be too hard. And so I told him, you know what, I'll do this. But you promise your membership stays in this church, at the West Bank Church. And you will continue to be an elder and you will continue to support the church. So we had to come up with that agreement. And then coming here, I mean, uh, I had history or I heard the history of Pastor Earnbrake. Being here for what, eight years? Hard to replace that or hard to beat that. For sure, eight years, uh, you know, leave a stamp and a mark on a person. So it's hard to fill those shoes. And, and I also felt inadequate coming here. And today, I would like to talk to you about a man. A man who experienced the challenge of replacing a leader. I'd like to invite you to open your Bibles in the book of Joshua. Open our Bibles in the book of Joshua, chapter 1. Joshua, chapter 1. I entitled this uh, sermon as uh, Faith versus Fear. And let's read the first, uh, the first nine verses. And, uh, and you probably understand a little bit about this idea of fear. Can I have a volunteer, somebody who'd like to read Joshua chapter 1, verses 1 to 9? Is there someone that would like to read? There's a microphone here. Bob, will you do the honors? Lord, it came to pass that the Lord spake unto Joshua, the son of Nun, Moses' minister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, thou, and all this people, unto the land which I do give to them, even to the children of Israel. Sorry, how many verses? Two verses, nine. Every place that the sole of your foot shall tread upon, that have I given unto you, as I said unto Moses. From the wilderness and this Lebanon, even unto the great river, the river Euphrates, all the land of the Hittites, and unto the great sea toward the going down of the sun, shall be your coast. There shall not be, 
there shall not any man be able to stand before thee all the days of thy life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with thee. I will not fail thee, nor forsake thee. Be strong and of good courage, for unto this people shalt thou divide for an inheritance the land, which I swear unto their fathers to give them. Only be thou strong and very courageous, that thou mayest observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded thee. Turn not from it to the right hand nor to the left, that thou mayest prosper whithersoever thou goest. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth, but thou shalt meditate therein day and night, that thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then thou shalt make thy way prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. Have I not commanded thee? Be strong and of good courage. Be not afraid. Therefore be thou dismayed, for the Lord thy God is with thee whithersoever thou goest. Thank you, Bob. Appreciate the, the reading. Moses is dead. And we turn the page. The book, the book of Deuteronomy is over. It ends with Moses' death. And now we turn the page to Joshua. And he starts by saying, After the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord, he came to pass that the Lord spoke to Joshua, son of Nun, Moses' sister, saying, Moses, my servant, is dead. Interesting that um, it starts right after the death of Moses. The, the text starts that way, after the death of Moses, bringing a continuity. Actually, um, theologians believe that Joshua ended the book of Deuteronomy. We, we believe that Moses wrote the book of Deuteronomy, but obviously the last uh, verses in the book of Deuteronomy detailed how Moses died. So obviously he couldn't have written that. And therefore, because of the, the fact that the book of Joshua uh, looks much more like a, a continuity to the book of Deuteronomy, it is believed that Joshua was the one that finished that book. So after the death of Moses, the servant of the Lord. Interesting that God does not call Moses the leader of Israel. God refers to Moses as the servant of the Lord. The servant of the Lord. Of the Lord. And this, this does not imply a servant as a slave. This implies a servant as a person who has completely surrendered itself to its master. Which in Moses' situation would be to God. And despite Moses' failures, God acknowledged Moses as having completely surrendered himself to God. Moses, the servant of the Lord. So God spoke to Moses and said, God spoke to Joshua and says, Moses, my servant, is dead. Now therefore arise, go over this Jordan, you and all the people of the land, which I am given to them, the children of Israel. So now God is telling Joshua, it's time to move on. At the end of Deuteronomy, we read that they mourned Moses' death for 30 days. So now God tells Joshua, that's it. You had your time. You had time to mourn. Now it's time to move on. Cross the Jordan. Now try to imagine. Joshua had been on that place before. He had had the chance to cross the Jordan. As a matter of fact, he did cross the Jordan. With another 11 spies. He went into the promised land. And Joshua felt so close to the promised land. But due to lack of faith of other 10 spies... And the, rest of the, and the rest of the population, they wandered in the desert for another 40 years. I can imagine Joshua being extremely anxious to hear that command. It is time. Finally, it is time. We can cross the Jordan. So God is telling him, go over the Jordan to the land. And God makes a point of saying, which I am giving. You're not taking the land. You cannot brag about it. You're not buying it. You're not stealing it. I, God, am giving you that land. And so God is very clear. The land which I am giving to thee, the children of Israel. Every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you. From the 
wilderness uh, and Lebanon as far as the great river, the river Euphrates. All the land of the Hittites and the great sea toward the going down of the sun shall be your territory. No man shall be able to stand before you. In other words, I will be with you. And no army, no other nation will be able to stand before you all the days of your life. As I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. So be strong and of good courage. And as you continue to read, you see this, this idea coming time after time. Be strong and of, of good courage. As I was with him, I will be with you. I will not leave you. I will not forsake you. I am with you. I will be with you. God keeps on bringing this message over and over to, to Joshua. For, the, for, to the, uh, for to this uh, people, you shall divide as an inheritance the land which I swore to their fathers to give to them. Only be strong and very courageous that you may observe to do according to all the law which most my servant commanded you to do. Do not turn from it to the right nor to the left that you may prosper <coughs> wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. Interesting, this idea, this book of the law shall be constantly present in your mouth. You should speak about it, you should think about it, but you shall meditate in it day and night that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. For then you will make your way prosperous and then you will have good success. Meditate, dwell in the book of the law, dwell in the scriptures, dot, 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 reward. You'll be prosperous. You'll have success. Have I not commanded you, God says again, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. Have you felt in, our, in your lives where life is taking down a path and we just feel alone? We feel that no one understands us. We feel that God is not there. We are just alone. And I imagine that at this particular time, Joshua is feeling inadequate. He's feeling unprepared. And he's feeling very uncertain of his path. So God is saying, be brave. Be courageous. Be strong. Do not be afraid. I am and I will be with you. Same way I was with Moses. I will be with you. So I'd like to analyze a little bit more in detail uh, these first um, few verses. Okay, who was Joshua? All right, who was Joshua? We hear a lot about Joshua. We talked about Joshua. But who was Joshua? Early life, in reality, we don't have that much information uh, regarding Joshua. So the Bible doesn't really say much about Joshua's early we know that his name means God is salvation. Now, how appropriate that the name Joshua has the same root as the name Jesus. And interesting, the definition or the meaning of the name Joshua. God is salvation. Same concept, same idea, same principle. We also know, according to the Bible, that he's the son of none. But there's no much information about who his father was. So it was just a way for them to decide or to, to affirm that Joshua was the son of. It was just a way for them to identify people. And we know that he was from the tribe of Ephraim. Now, the tribe of Ephraim, when they divided, when Joshua divided the, the country, the, the promised land, he took this for his tribe. The tribe of Ephraim was strategically located between the mountains. Very fertile land. I guess somehow he made the best pick. He selected the best land for himself. Actually, in this particular area where the tribe of Ephraim was, we find uh, spiritual strongholds for the children of Israel, Shechem and Shiloh. And as you as you read in scriptures, you you can read and understand uh, those specific places. So Ephraim was strategically located and and held a tremendous importance among the other tribes. Now, Ephraim was not a son of Jacob. And 
I don't know if you knew this, but Ephraim was actually Joseph's son. But because we don't have a Joseph tribe, his two sons, his two sons became tribes. Joseph That's right. Thank you. Ephraim and Manasseh. They became two tribes. Now, because and, and yesterday I was wrapping my mind around this. Two tribes instead of Joseph makes 13 names. Right? And I was like, I, I don't know, somehow I have a mind blocked and I can understand it. It's 13 names, and yet we talk about 12 tribes. But many times when you talk about 12 tribes, we exclude Joseph, obviously, which was not a tribe, and we also exclude Because Levites were not supposed to have land. They were a special tribe set aside to serve the temple and to be the spiritual leaders of the nation. So because the Levites were not a tribe and Joseph was not a tribe, Ephraim and Manasseh came to be a tribe. Now a little detail. When, when Joseph heard that Jacob was about to die, Joseph came with his two sons so that Jacob Very strategically placed in the country. And actually, if you flip a few pages back to the Deuteronomy chapter, um, chapter 32, 33 actually. If you flip a few pages back to Deuteronomy chapter 33, you see Moses blessing the different tribes. And now here Moses blesses Joseph. All right. And at the end on verses um, 17, he says, His glory is like a, first bull, a firstborn bull, and his horns like the horns of the wild ox. Together with them, referring to Joseph, together with them, he shall push the peoples to the ends of the earth. And then he says, They are the ten thousands of Ephraim, and they are the thousands of Manasseh. Fulfilling what... Jacob had predicted that Ephraim would be bigger and more important than Manasseh. So, other than that, we really don't know much about Joshua. He's from the tribe of Ephraim, son of Nun. His name is God's salvation, and that's about it. We have events, but regarding his early life, we don't know much about that. So, uh, let's continue trying to find out. He's training. What training did Joshua receive? Well, the first thing that is mentioned is uh, two months after they left Egypt, Joshua is mentioned for the first time regarding to the place called uh, Rufidi. Now, the, the Israelites were under attack. And Moses called Joshua to organize a small army to go out and defeat the, the people that were attacking them. And so that's the first time that we actually read about Joshua, and especially Joshua taking a role, a position of leadership. And then we read about him in Mount Sinai. And there's a, it, it kind of seems that Joshua pops up here and there. And, and, and all of these times, it's in, in connection with Moses. It's almost like the Bible is trying to establish a link between Joshua and Moses. Now in Mount Sinai, we read that uh, Moses, Aaron, the seven elders, and Joshua went towards the mountain. So there's Joshua there. And then Joshua was the only one that waited down for Moses when he came down from Mount Sinai. As a matter of fact, we read 
So Joshua is, 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 is coming up more and more frequently uh, as, as the years go by. Joshua was one of the spies that were sent to uh, look at the promised land. And, uh, and he was also representative, obviously, from Ephraim. Now think about this. You have a tribe of thousands and thousands and thousands of people. And each tribe was to provide one representative. Somehow, people looked at Joshua and recognized in him leadership skills, recognized in him spiritual skills, and therefore Joshua was one of the, the spies that were sent to, um, to the promised land. Joshua was also carefully chosen. It was not like we do today, democratic uh, election. Joshua did not run for the office. Joshua did not petition to uh, be chosen. Joshua, there was no nominating committee <laughs> to um, ask Joshua to serve as a leader. No, Joshua was carefully chosen. And in Deuteronomy 34, 9, we read that he was chosen because he was a man full of the spirit of wisdom. Full of the spirit of wisdom. And again, in that same verse, we read that Moses laid his hands upon him. So it was not just a random choice. Joshua was specifically chosen for his mission. As a matter of fact, you go back at the beginning of chapter 32 of the book of Deuteronomy, and God calls Moses and Joshua, and God specifically tells Moses to lay his hands upon Joshua. You read the, four, the, the last uh, uh, two, three chapters in the book of Deuteronomy. Very interesting because you lay out the foundation, lays out the foundation to the book of Joshua. So he was carefully chosen. And his choice, made by God, and I think that's an important element that we need to remember, his choice, made by God, was based on four specific characteristics. So let's look at each one. First, you need to look at his temperament and disposition. You cannot um, have a man do a job if that man is not ready or willing to do that job. So Joshua had to match his temperament, his disposition with the job that needed to be done. Joshua had a natural capacity for military affairs and it was proven time after time uh, while they were in the desert. Joshua was bold. He was firm. He would defend his convictions no matter what. He had the temperament. He had the disposition. He had received previous training. After all, for 40 years, he had served as Moses' assistant. For 40 years, he was um, a leader to the nation, like the prime minister. So Joshua had gained a lot of training, a lot of experience during the last or the previous 40 years. His reputation preceded him. Just think about this for a second. Joshua went to the promised land as a spy. Twelve came back. Two stood up and said, let's go in. The God is giving us the promised land. Let's move on. Ten said, no, 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 we should not go there. And the, the population, they heard so as a punishment, as a consequence of that, for the next 40 years, they wander in the desert until everybody from that generation died. Only two remain alive, Joshua and Caleb. So all the younger generation, as they are growing, they're looking at Joshua, and they're understanding that they are wandering in the desert because of everybody else's mistakes except... Joshua and Caleb, his reputation preceded him. At the same time, you're surrounded by a multitude, thousands of people wanting to hear about the promised land. You have 10 people saying, no, we, we're doomed if we go into the promised land. And 
And Joshua said, no, let's do it. He was bold. He was strong enough to defend his convictions. Together with Caleb, they stood to defend what would be or what could be considered an unpopular cause. So his reputation was of tremendous importance. And finally, the task to be accomplished. And as I said before, the man and the need must correspond. There is a task the man needs to be willing to fulfill, to accomplish that task. God's choice was based on these four characteristics. Have you thought about, for example, not the right time. I've seen, I've heard people say, you know, I would like to be an elder. I would like to be the head deacon. I would like to be treasurer. But if the elders are not there, is it really wise to place that person in a leadership position? So the same principles that God used to select Joshua should also be applied to us. Temperament, disposition, training, reputation, Willingness to accomplish the task. And Joshua fit all of these characteristics. Time and time again, God is saying, be strong and be courageous. He had the training. He had the, the experience. He had the country behind him, the nation behind him. And yet, time and time again, God is saying, Joshua, be strong and be courageous. Joshua, I will be with you. Joshua, be strong. Joshua, go on, move forward. Time and time again, God is reassuring. And, and you know, if we take a little bit of time to think about it, I think that God is trying to build and shift Joshua's mind from a, a sense of inadequacy to a sense of, I can do this. Under God's guidance, I can do this. But why would Joshua feel inadequate? Well, Sometimes big shoes are hard to fill or are difficult, are difficult to fill. Moses was the best leader that they could have had. Moses was raised as a prince in Egypt. Remember that? He had the training from the best schools in the world. On top of that, Moses led a rebellion without an army. Millions of people left Egypt. No army. You want to ask for a better leader? No. Moses was the best leader they could have had. Moses had a staff. <laughs> I'm sure Joshua had a staff as well. But the Bible tells that Moses' staff turned into a snake. And then back to a staff. The Bible doesn't say anything about Joshua having a special staff. Lord, can you help me? Moses could feed the people. Manna, remember, every day. Moses prayed, and every day people were getting the food in the morning. But not just that. They started complaining, oh, we're hungry, we want meat. Please give us meat. Again, Moses prayed. Suddenly you have this dark cloud of birds coming. Can you fight that? Or, or can you even match to that? So yes, Joshua might have been feeling quite inadequate. Moses talked to God face to face. To the point that when he came down the mountain, his face was radiant. Joshua is thinking about all this. Moses could command earthquakes. At some point to defend himself, he commanded an earthquake. He prayed small earthquake happen and happen and help them defeat their enemies. Moses had an army made up of slaves. That's what they were. They were slaves in Egypt and they made an army. He was the leader for over 40 years. Tons of experience. At his death, the Bible tells that his body was in excellent condition. His funeral lasted for 30 years days. He was loved by everybody. And Joshua is being called to replace this man. 
Imagine what would be in Joseph's tombstone. Now, we don't know where it's at, obviously. The Bible tells us that no one knows. But if there was a tombstone, I bet you would read something like this. For no one has ever shown the mighty power or performed the awesome deeds that Moses did in the sight of all Israel. Let's go back to the last verses in Deuteronomy, and you find this as summarized of those verses. So now God is saying, Joshua, I want you to be the leader. You're going to replace Moses. You're going to take over for him. You're going to lead millions of people into the promised land. And Joshua's thinking, man, these are big shoes. I don't know how I'm going to do this. So time and time again, God is telling you, be strong, be of good courage. I am with you. Same way I was with Moses, I will and I am with you. God is giving Joshua three assurances that he needed. And so God is telling Joshua the first assurance that God is faithful in his promise. And you read verses 2 and 3. Let's go there in verses 2 and 3 in the book of Joshua. Chapter 1. Moses, my servant, is dead. Verses 2. Now therefore, arise, go over this Jordan, you and all these people, to the land which I am giving to them, the children of Israel, every place that the sole of your foot will tread upon, I have given you, as I said to Moses. God is reaffirming a promise that he made to Moses, but he goes even before that. He extends back to Abraham. And God is saying, Joshua, I didn't bring you out of Egypt just for no reason. I promised you a land, I promised you a land where honey and milk abound, and I want you there. You're going to lead these people there. Same way I was with them, I will be with you. You will take over this land. And God was faithful in accomplishing his promises. Sometimes we struggle because we really don't think that God will do for us what he has promised. But the reality, the same way that he said to Joshua, God will fulfill his promises. He promised to Abraham. He promised to Moses. He will fulfill through Joshua. Very clear, God let uh, Joshua know that he, God, is the giver. And that he, the giver, always gives, always fulfills his promise. The second assurance that God wanted for Moses to, to get was that uh, God is faithful in his presence. God is faithful in his presence. In verses 5, we read, No man <clears throat> shall be able to stand before you all the days of your life. And as I was with Moses, so I will be with you. I will not leave you nor forsake you. God is with Moses, whatever he goes. For as long as, Mo as Joshua was connected to God... Nothing could stand in their way. God never leaves us in a situation where he brought us in and then he leaves us alone. He will never do that. He guides us, he takes us in a certain path, and he will walk us through that path. If we find ourselves alone, it's not because God left us. But it's because in our choices we decided to take a step back we decided to step away from God. We decided to leave Him. Because whatever God says, go into the promised land and I will be with you. Whatever your foot steps on, I will be with you. It means that, yes, challenge will come. It means that, yes, there will be uh, barriers, there will be walls, there will be mountains to overcome. But God is there. On verses 9, God says... Have I not commanded you, be strong and of good courage. Do not be afraid nor be dismayed, for the Lord your God is with you wherever you go. So God is also reassuring uh, Joshua of his presence. And finally, God is assuring Joshua in his precepts, in his commands. And we see in verses 7, 7 and 8, it says... Um, 
Only be strong and very courageous, that you may observe to do according to all the law which Moses my servant commanded you to do. Do not turn from it to the right nor to the left, that you may prosper wherever you go. This book of the law shall not depart from your mouth, but you shall meditate in it day and night, that you may observe to do according to all that is written in it. Now God is not telling Moses, uh, Joshua, these are my commands, and you need to get up at a certain time, you need to eat this food at this time, you need to do this work, and you need to do that work, and then at the end of the day you need to go to bed at this time. Those are not God's commands. But back then at that time, God's law was a reflection of God's character. Moses' books were still unpopular, let's put it that way. They were gaining their popularity. The thing that was really popular at that time was the commandments, God's commandments. And God's love, God's character is a reflection of the, uh, is reflected in those commandments. So you think of a nation that left Egypt that has no knowledge of God, that is growing in their knowledge of God, of who God is, and now God is teaching them, I am a God of love. I am a God that cares so much about you, that brought you out of Egypt. I am a God whose love is reflected in the commandments. So yes, spend time with my commandments. Look at them. Read them. Study them. The, the text says here that um, the book of the law shall not depart from your mouth. He presents this idea uh, in, in its original sense. He presents the idea that the person is constantly thinking about it to the point that he starts talking to himself. Oh, what does this mean? Hmm, interesting. I, I never thought from this perspective. Oh, maybe that. And so now the, he brings the idea of, of this constant deep um, meditation in the commandments of God. The commandments that are a reflection of his love. So God is saying, Joshua, do not turn to the left, not to the right, but... If you do turn to the left or to the right, I am still faithful to my commandments. I still love you. And we see that when they came to Jericho, they followed exactly what God told them to do. Walk around the city. They did. The walls came down. Just a few days later, they went to the city of Hai. They, they lost the battle there. Some of them said, oh, that town is fine, it's easy, there's no big deal, we can just go there with about 3,000 people. Boom, they were defeated there. They deviated from God's plan. People died in that battle. But despite that, God is saying, the law reflects my love for you. And despite the circumstances, despite where you go, I will still love you. So do not deviate. Meditate in it day and night because you will get to know me. You will get to know who I am. So yes, Joshua had big shoes to fill. Yes, Joshua may have felt inadequate. But time and time again, God said, I will be with you. I am with you. Same way I was with Moses, I am also with you. And beloved, you, you may be experiencing in your lives challenges, whether they're physical, whether they're emotional, spiritual, financial. You may experience all those challenges. But, but today, if you leave, as you leave this sanctuary, be assured that the same way God was with Moses, God was with Joshua, God is with us. His promises will last for eternity. He will never fail in His promises. The same way he was with them, he will be with us.